Um, yeah, it's a great honor to be invited to, to speak here. And um, I wanted to make sure at the beginning I acknowledged uh, Art Franklin, Aaron Wirth, two of the people who were working with me on um, the work on the magnitude 9 earthquakes on our coast. I also wanted to repeat what Amanda just said, that um, this lecture series is supported by IRIS. IRIS is the group uh, run by NSF that puts instruments across the country and helps us do all the seismological experiments. And the Seismological Society of America, which has existed since the 1930s, trying to make sure we have a society to exchange information on what are earthquakes and how do we mitigate the danger of them. Usually I try to get everyone to ask me questions while I'm talking, uh, but I guess we're saving them for the end this time. Uh, I, I wanted to start with a little outline of what I'm going to say and just kind of... I, been to various places, mostly in California until like a decade ago, uh, graduate school at Caltech and then working in the Bay Area with the USGS. Then I taught at UCLA for a decade. And back then I didn't recognize the issues up in the Pacific Northwest. It was sort of like that show, Here Come the Brides, if you're old enough to remember that. <laughs> Somewhere up in the Northwest and I didn't know the kind of hazards we had. And that's really what I'll be talking about tonight. Not just the M9s, but all the different kinds of earthquakes we have to worry about. So I'll talk a little bit about kind of the general science we're doing up here. And then I'll talk about the three styles of earthquakes, which, you know, when I was in California, didn't really make sense to me. And in fact, I gave a version of this talk at uh, Berkeley and Caltech and actually back in New York in the last couple of months. And even among the seismologists, they aren't sure they understand our issues as well as we do locally. Um, and I only left the University of Washington a month or two ago to go down to California yet again uh, to work at USC. So I'll talk about the M9 project uh, specifically, the biggest earthquakes on the coast. Um, then I'll talk a bit about earthquake early warning, something we've been developing the last couple of years that's still in, in the process of being built. Then I'll start arguing why we'd like to do a lot of experiments on the seafloor to get a better understanding of uh, the risks that we're facing. So I'll start with the tectonics, uh, tectonic setting. So if you've had plate tectonics, this will be a review. But the plate tectonics up here are essentially a collision of tectonic plates. So you're looking at the, a map of the Northwest over here. And basically, the US is part of the North American plate. That includes kind of the crust, the mantle, and uh, much of the uh, kind of shallow Earth. Because um, this is all roughly floating on sort of softer material over which it can flow. Uh, and there's a collision between the oceanic plates offshore. There's a big Pacific plate, but there's also this smaller Juan de Fuca plate spreading from the Pacific plate. And the Juan de Fuca plate is colliding with the North American plate. So that's the plate tectonic uh, interaction here. It's colliding and kind of sinking underneath the North American plate along this kind of red boundary here. Um, and that's what makes our tectonics, that's what makes our earthquake action in the Northwest. Okay, and it turns out we have three kinds of earthquakes when this configuration's happening. One kind of earthquakes are the big ones right on the plate boundary where the plates slide past each other. Another kind, and I mark that by red. You'll see red dots on a lot of these figures. Another kind of earthquakes are the, where these pink and magenta dots are. These are the ones where the oceanic plate is pushing underneath and it's bending and crumpling as it goes down. And the third kind of earthquakes are these yellow ones. These are ones up in the crust. So they're in the North American plate as it's deforming in response to this collision uh, that's happening over here. So you'll hear about those three kinds of earthquakes. <clears throat> but to back up a little bit, I mean, I got interested in earthquakes back in the 70s when I was in undergraduate school. <clears throat> and this is a picture of what they call the Palmdale Bulge. Uh, does anyone remember the Palmdale Bulge? Yeah, it, it was a kind of a spectacle in the sense that uh, we were trying to predict earthquakes and there was a kind of a race between Russia and China and the U.S. We all knew that we'd like to know when the earthquakes were coming and we couldn't figure out how to predict them. And so when they were looking at the Mojave Desert, so this is the kind of the coastline from around Los Angeles with the San Andreas Fault and the Garlock Fault, they thought they saw the Mojave Desert swell up about a foot over the course of a couple of months. And they had some rocks where as they strained them, just before they broke, they'd start to crack and swell a little bit. 
Um, so they thought this whole area was just on the verge of having a big earthquake. You can see you know, the Time cover magazine, the seismologists were quoted as saying, within a decade we'll be predicting earthquakes to get people out of the way. Um, as you should be aware, that didn't work. It, it, it turned out what happened here is they were doing leveling lines, you know, just like surveyors you see. And they got really interested in what was happening, so they doubled the density. They put twice as many posts out there, and they didn't correct right for the way the light bends in the atmosphere, the gradient in the atmosphere. So the desert didn't do anything. They just changed the experiment and misinterpreted it. <laughs> And, and it took a generation of scientists retiring before everyone agreed about what was happening, which was, it was a big mistake. And as you know, we're just not anywhere on predicting earthquakes so far. I also wanted to mention kind of our most, the fam most famous earthquake since I came to Seattle 10 years ago. This is the, the beast quake. Um, <laughs> you'll hear at the end, we haven't had a really big earthquake since I came. Um, and what happened here is I was looking at YouTube videos uh, after Marshawn Lynch went for that tremendous run in the game against the New Orleans Saints, and I kind of mistakenly thought the stadium was swaying a little bit. So I looked at our strong motion instruments. Those are kind of instruments that are, we have through the city, and we could see this burst of energy, and it was right when he w went for a run. <laughs> and... Uh, Basically, the fans made enough noise that uh, they shook the stadium, the stadium shook the instrument. And, and then uh, I called our press guy, Bill Steele, who said, let's call this the 12th man earthquake. And someone from the Seattle Times, we sent it to the press, and the Seattle Times guy said, that's great, but you have to you know, annotate it. So I kind of made up a bunch of stuff here. The ball's hiked, and then he knocks over the corner back, and, you know, and they kick the extra point. And, and I, I'm not sure I would have been quite as enthusiastic if I'd realized that the station was actually across the street from the football stadium. But we actually dither them on the map. That means we move them so that people can't go just steal our batteries. Um, it looked like it was a little further away. But, you know, of course the fans are loud. And we went, and we went back uh, two or three times to kind of refine the experiment and watch more football. Um, <laughs> So that was one of our, uh, and I think it was very effective outreach to show people what a seismometer is and how seismic waves work, and to help the local team. So another thing we're doing is something we call the IMUSH experiment, where the results are just starting to come out. We've got five universities working together in a, this $3 million experiment to put hundreds of instruments around Mount St. Helens. What we'd like to do is see what the structure underneath is. We've got a decent look at the upper five or 10 miles under the volcano. But we're trying to look deeper down to the, that subducting slab that's about 100 miles underneath and see the plumbing of how the magma rises and just know what we should be looking at as we try to evaluate when St. Helens will become active again. Um, but that's something where we're still working on the data. It's actually led by Ken Crager within the University of Washington. Um, so this shows a cross-section I showed a little bit earlier in a little more detail. So again, we're looking at the North American plate. You can barely see the Puget Sound up at the top here. This is that oceanic plate pushing underneath. Um, and what I've highlighted on here is a couple of things. One is, you know, this is that boundary where we have the great earthquakes. It's a big boundary. It has most of the motion between the plates. But again, the, this is where the downgoing plate kind of crumples right under the Puget Sound in its most damaging earthquakes. And way up here is where the earthquakes happen in the crust. But also there's a strange zone that has a slow slip and tremor where this blue patch is. And what's happening is, you know, shallow it's locked. Every 500 years it moves here. It moves, you know, 10 or 20 meters. If you go deep enough, if the earth is fluid enough, it just continuously moves. So it moves, you know, a couple centimeters a year steadily. But there's a strange zone in between where it locks up for about a year, and then in the course of a month, it kind of jiggles a little bit and then moves just a centimeter or two. We still don't understand why this zone does that, but we clearly have seen this do this year after year. About every 14 months, we get a, effectively a magnitude 7 earthquake down here drawn out over a month. So you can't even feel it, but that's how this part of the boundary between the tectonic plates moves. So that's one of our favorite scientific topics, but it's not clear that affects the danger at all. 
you know, the pattern that we see in the slow slip zone. Okay, so I just put this up to remind people that, you know, this is why my family likes my being a seismologist. I must be doing something useful if John Stewart makes fun of me from time to time. Um, they, they really appreciate my sisters, especially like to see that people make fun of me. Um, and I just put this in before the talk in case you were curious. I don't know if people saw the headline last week that the... Uh, as the Earth's rotation slows, it should double the number of big earthquakes in the next year or two. And that's, that's probably nonsense. I, I wanted to you know, point out that most of what we do talking to the public is trying to argue against what they just read in the newspaper. And, and this is the headline they put, scientists say the number of severe quakes is likely to rise strongly next year because of a periodic slowing of the Earth's rotation. Did, did anyone see that in the news? Yeah. It, it, we, of course, noticed it as seismologists immediately and started to argue. But the, the argument is that if you make... And the, the, this is what we do as scientists. We just make these plots and see if anything agrees with anything else. <laughs> and this black line here is how many earthquakes bigger than magnitude 7 happened each year for the last century. And then this blue line is how much the Earth's rotation rate changed over those years with all kinds of the, the numerical tricks, and they also shifted it a little bit to make it line up a little better. So they're arguing that, that this curve looks like this curve, which it, it sort of does, and then they, they wrote a paper to Nature, although Nature rejected it. I, I, I was one of the reviewers, I have to admit. And the theory they had is, you know, as the Earth, you know, it's spinning, and when you spin something, it makes a big circu bigger circumference. The faster it spins, the bigger the circumference is compared to the pole, polar radius. And if you stretch it, you're basically kind of pulling apart the tectonic plates a little bit. And if you slow it down, they're kind of compressing a little bit. So they're trying to argue that stretching and compression, which was like one part in 10 to the ninth, was causing earthquakes. It's kind of a fun theory. Um, but the bottom line here is, you know, they saw that correlation, which, you know, is just what I showed you. It's not very reliable. That's the Roger Billum. He's a friend of mine. I mean, he's on our advisory committee and stuff, but this is really a little beyond the pale. Uh, and so then they proposed three different ways that could cause earthquakes, and the first two have been ruled out, and they're still working on the third. And oh, I lost something here, but the, the real de deadly argument against it is that you can sort of see this rough agreement for the curves with the biggest earthquakes, but you look at the somewhat smaller earthquakes, which should show the same pattern if the stresses are varying, and it has much better resolution because there are a lot more small earthquakes and you can't see the pattern. So we're pretty sure this is another case of the things that make the headlines in the newspapers usually aren't uh, the big new developments. Um, Okay, so back to the topic of the Pacific Northwest. This is the national hazard map. So this shows, you know, where you're likely to be strongly shaken around the country. It's kind of engineer's units. It's acceleration uh, at a particular period, 0.3 seconds, so 3 hertz shaking. But the point is, you know, the west coast is where the earthquake danger is, as you could probably guess. In California, it's the San Andreas system up to Cape Mendocino, and north of that is the subduction zone I showed, the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, there's a secondary faulting, uh, the Wasatch fault zone over in Utah and uh, Idaho and so forth. And there's also this hot spot in, in New Madrid. Basically, there's a big set of earthquakes in the year 1811 and 1812. They think they could see several repetitions in the older geology. We don't really understand this, and until we understand it, it'll be red on the map. But char yeah, well, and, and it's, it has some risk, but we argue a lot, is it really this risk, or is it like factor four slower, or there's a guy in Northwestern who says it's, it's done, it's had all the earthquakes, you can just relax. And that's another one of the hazards of uh, our field. Uh, and there's also Charleston. There was a big earthquake in Charleston in 1872. We don't understand that at all. But since it had one, it could have another one. So it's another red spot on the map. But the bright red's on the west coast. Okay, and this puts dollar amounts on the damage. So it went from the hazard map to the risk. You know, risk is what it costs. Hazard is how often it shakes. And what you can see is then the northwest 
our earthquake problem has been estimated by FEMA to be a half a billion dollars a year. Okay, so most years nothing happens and nothing's damaged. And every 50 or 100 years, we have tens of billions of dollars of damage. And every so often, we have huge amounts of damage. Taken on a yearly basis, it's about half a billion a year. So that's a major piece of the risk. And then California is even much more, about three billion a year. Um, so again, not much a lot of years, but a few years, it's really expensive. And that's why we spend on the order of tens of millions of dollars on our seismic networks and paying seismologists at universities uh, and just doing that in earthquake science. So that's the majority of the risk in the country. So in the Pacific Northwest, the regions we're most interested in, and you know, there's of course the greatest danger on the coast, right above the subduction zone. It both gets shaken when there's a when these big earthquakes and it gets pounded by the tsunami. Um, we're also deeply concerned about the Puget Sound because there's a concentration of people and industry and infrastructure, and that includes Vancouver and Victoria, uh, and the I-5 corridor is at risk in Oregon as well with Portland, Eugene, and Salem. It's not as much a risk, but still fairly serious risk. And then the, uh, we're somewhat concerned with all the dams in the mountains up above the Puget Sound. They're expensive. If they break, they, they flood the people below them. And we're concerned with Hanford Nuclear Reservation um, because it has those vats of radioactive waste that are kind of leaching into the ground. And, uh, um, so we carefully study that area as well. So that's what we're concerned with. You know, Eastern Oregon and Washington doesn't have as much uh, seismicity, as many earthquakes, and it also doesn't have as many people and infrastructure at risk. So we pay less attention there. At least I can say that in Western Washington here. <laughs> uh, and if you look carefully at Seattle, um, I'm not really an engineer, but uh, this map, uh, again made by Art Frankel at the USGS, um, shows kind of the worst places in the city as far as getting shaken badly. And there are a couple of, of things to note. You know, first of all, Seattle, if you pay attention to the newspapers, is kind of the last big city on the West Coast that hasn't got a plan what to do with its unreinforced masonry buildings. There are about a thousand of those. They're at risk, some level of risk, and Portland and the Bay Area and Los Angeles all have plans of what to do, and we don't even have a plan. We've had plans, but it's a question of who pays for, the, for what you could do about these buildings. So that's, it needs attention, um, and I'm sure people will figure something out in the next few decades. Uh, and one of the issue, another issue is we have very soft soil here in Seattle. Um, then the soil, when it shakes, can liquefy and get even weaker. So, you know, that's the flat, wet areas that, that are prone to liquefaction. Another problem is the Seattle Fault. And you'll notice, notice the colors are darker toward the middle here. And that's because the Seattle Fault runs kind of right through here somewhere. And um, the Seattle Fault is an active uh, fault. And that, in fact, is a majority of the risk to downtown, not the big coastal earthquakes. The Seattle Fault right underneath. Uh, and this risk is kind of modulated by... Uh, this, which is uh, the Duwamish Valley, and what the Duwamish Valley is filled with is a lahar that came off of uh, Mount Rainier. Periodically, the sides of Mount Rainier slump and come down the valley, and this is very soft, wet soil that is prone to liquefaction and also amplifies the shaking because it's so soft. There's similarly soft soil up in the Inter Bay region where we have the, our rail facilities. Uh, and also over here, right next to the university, um, with the uh, University Village Shopping Center and the park right next to my house, it's called, uh, I, I call it the Methane Marsh, but it's, uh, it's very nice it's not built, and that it's not built because it's on ground like that. So, it, you know, soil conditions are critical, and proximity to faults is important, and, you know, the whole thing's over these deep earthquakes and near the coast that has big earthquakes. Okay, and so here's just a map of some of the faults around the Puget Sound. So you, know, you can get an idea of the risk, you know, the, the Olympia Fault, the Tacoma Fault, the Seattle Fault, South Whidbey Island Fault goes through a bunch of towns on the east side of the Puget Sound. 
There's fault up by Bellingham and more faults up by Victoria and Vancouver. So basically the Puget Sound is filled with faults um, and the seismicity underneath doesn't really agree with these. So we're not really sure what the risk is at depth. We just know there's some danger of earthquakes in the upper 10 or 20 kilometers under the Puget Sound. Okay. And homing in on the Seattle Fault, you know, here are a couple of ideas where this fault is broken in the past. The geologists go out and find the, the fault scarps where it's broken. And uh, you can see it extends from Bremerton, from right under the sub-base, to Seattle, downtown Seattle, um, south edge of Bellevue, um, and then Sammamish. But, you know, the way we worry about these things, we're not so concerned about Bellevue, because even though it has a lot of tall buildings, they're generally pretty recently built. It's really the older buildings that, where they didn't know the risk or the construction methods that are at more risk. So Bellevue has a few things to worry about, but Seattle has a lot. Uh, another factor here is the landslides, and this is something one of my students did. If there were just a magnitude six and a half on the Seattle fault in a wet season, this is where you might expect landslides, uh, and clearly that would be quite a problem. Um, so that was, again, that was a crustal fault. The Seattle Fault is a fault in the crust. Another fault that was similar, another earthquake that was similar, was this one that happened out near Lake Chelan in 1872. It, um, until a couple of years ago, we didn't know exactly where this was located because not many people were here in 1872. And um, the Canadians said it's over in the U.S. The U.S. said it's up in Canada. But just a couple of years ago, the USGS figured out what we'd suspected for quite a while, that it was right here near Lake Chelan. And we, we had this idea because that's been a hot spot of seismicity, as long as we've been watching the earthquakes. There's lots and lots of little earthquakes near here. But they found, they finally found the smoking gun when they found this fault scarp. Um, it's a little hard to see on here, but you have to take my word for it. This is a scarp where you can see the ground moved in an earthquake. And it has this landslide that, from local farmers, uh, you can tell it moved in the year of the earthquake. It wasn't there the year before, it was there the year after. So putting all those together, it's pretty clear this is where that magnitude 6.5 earthquake, uh, might have been a 7, um, hit. But the real point here is just anywhere in eastern Oregon and Washington could have an earthquake like this. They're rare, but they are uh, the, probably the main earthquake danger. Okay, until you get close to the coast and the magnitude nines. Okay, so th those pink dots, the ones within the subducting slab, are the second kind of earthquake. And what I've plotted here is every earthquake in our catalog, at least up to the border, that was deeper than 40 kilometers, so deeper than about 25 miles um, below the surface. And what you can see is that, you know, they had happened anywhere along the coast, all the way from the California border up to the northern U.S.-Canada border. But most of them are under the Puget Sound. And, and we understand this because this is where the subduction zone has the, this oceanic plate going down and crinkling, sort of like a tablecloth over the corner of the table. It's deforming uh, right under the Puget Sound so that we get a lot of earthquakes. And these three red dots are the biggest earthquakes, and those big ones are the 2001 Nisqually earthquake, the one uh, is about 50 kilometers down, about 30 miles. And, but before that, in 1965 and in 1949, there were similar earthquakes under Seattle or Tacoma. Um, so that seems to be the biggest uh, risk around, the most frequent damaging earthquakes around here. Okay, so we've covered you know, these two kinds of earthquakes. That leaves the big ones on the coast, and that's, that's what we've concentrated on in a big study in the last couple of years. And this, what we're worried about here are ones that break the whole coast. It might be magnitude 9 or might break half the coastline. That's about a magnitude 8. If it's smaller, more like a magnitude 7, it doesn't reach inland of the Puget Sound very strongly. And we know a lot about these earthquakes, partly by this guy, who you know, we argue with a lot, but he's got, he owns the data. He, he's collected these cores, so he takes a cylindrical sample of the uh, soft material uh, many places off the coast. And when he looks carefully, he can tell when there's probably a tsunami deposit, not a tsunami deposit, a uh, turbidite. 
So these turbidites are kind of landslides that come down the submarine canyons. You can see kind of mixed up layers and on top of them more fine grain stuff and then back to the regular material. And when he looks at all these sites, he can date when he sees these turbidite deposits and when he sees an event at many places all at once, he infers there was a big earthquake. If there's an, some kind of a landslide just in a few things, it could be a storm, it could be just a single uh, landslide, but if it's happening all along the coast, it's probably an earthquake. So he can see back 10,000 years, he can drill deeply enough to get 10,000 years sedimentary history. And when he puts that together, he finds that there are 20 events that broke the whole of Cascadia in the last 10,000 years. So that translates into about an event every 500 years. In addition, he sees about 20 more events that seem to have broken the southern half of Cascadia. So putting these two together, it looks like the southern half of Cascadia has an event about every 250 years, and the northern half has one about every 500 years. And of these ones in the south, half are magnitude nines, half of them are about magnitude eight to eight and a half. So we have a strong history of great earthquakes along Cascadia. And I should say, this looks pretty good. He's got convinced us all of this, and this is what we spend our time arguing about. Uh, those, are, those are harder to interpret because they're fewer samples and could be storms or maybe he's not seeing all of them. Um, and this just show, this shows the time history, years before present, from now to 10,000 years ago. And these lines indicate where they extend from the south to the north. So the long lines are the magnitude nines, the short lines are the magnitude eight and eight and a half. What you can immediately see is the, this most recent 5,000 years has a lot more events than the prior 5,000. So maybe he has trouble seeing them uh, further in the past. Um, or maybe some of these are something other than big earthquakes. You can also see that these events aren't regularly spaced. So for example, it's been 300 years since the last magnitude nine, but that doesn't mean we're safe for 200 more years. Sometimes these events are closer than that. And sometimes we have a fair stretch between the big earthquakes such that we may not see a big earthquake for hundreds of years. Okay. Okay, so the engineers demand numbers. You know, we make these plots, we argue about them, but somebody's got to make numbers. And that's what Art Frankel, that guy I showed on the first slide, does. He, he kind of uh, is the referee in making the numbers. And when we do that, for a magnitude 9 earthquake, we come up with somewhere between 12 and 18 percent chance in the next 50 years of having one of those magnitude 9 earthquakes. You can think if, if it's one every 500 years, that's a 10 percent chance in 50 years. One in 500 for 50 years is one in 10. Um, but it turns out that since it's been 320 years since the last one, we're already past the safe period, the safer period, into the period where it's actually above average in danger. So this is a little higher risk than the long-term risk, just because we've already passed the 300 safest years. In the south, the numbers are worse because they have those extra magnitude eight and a, eight and a half, it's up to 25 to 45, depending who's reading you the numbers. Um, the deep earthquakes, however, are much more common. You know, we have had three of those in the last 100 years, less than 100 years. So any 50 years, we have a chance of 84% of having an event bigger than six and a half. Um, so that means in the next 50 years, we'll probably see more than one of these events like Nisqually. Um, and finally, these crustal earthquakes are pretty rare. The faults like the Seattle Fault move slowly. And if we just look at the Seattle Fault in the next 50 years, there's about a 5% chance of having one bigger than six and a half. You know, it's good it's that small because that'd be a pretty bad earthquake. And if you put all the faults in the Puget Sound together, there's about a 15% chance in 50 years of having a six and a half or bigger. About the same as the chance of having a nine on the coast. So this would damage things more intensely, but in a smaller area, this would be a moderate level of damage across the whole coast. So this would probably be chaos for the economy. This would devastate uh, a city or two in the Puget Sound. Okay. So that's, those are the numbers we tell the engineers. And then this kind of comes to actually what a guy was asking me before the talk too, this uh, article, was it Atlantic uh, a year or two ago? 
Uh, and what happened here is that the author was a little more literary than a scientist like and, and superimposed these two sentences just to be dramatic. They said, by the time the shaking ceased and the tsunami has receded, the region will be unrecognizable, talking about magnitude nines on the coast. And of course this is true, where the tsunami hits, you know, that, that, that's all gone. Um, and then she said, the regional FEMA director says, and I hate to even put his name here, says, our operating assumption is that everything west of Interstate 5 will be toast. And, you know, what he meant is it's an exercise. So they want to test everything up to I-5. They didn't mean everything up to I-5 is going to be rubble. But people read these two sentences and thought that there'd just be destruction up to I-5 and they went and watched the San Andreas movie. And I think they're making a sequel that's going to be a Northwest movie. Um, and then we wound up with things like... Uh, the Fox News uh, report, uh, where you know, they said everything west of I-5 will be gone. Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, Portland, Salem, seven million people plus tourists. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I don't really mean to pick on Fox. You know, CBS got the same string theorist expert to misinterpret the earthquakes, but people saw this and reacted poorly, although they actually gave us lots more money to, to build the early warning system and research. So I, they, I complained to the people in DC and they just said, you know, consider yourself lucky. Um, but you, know, you can see how this gives a very much the wrong impression of what would happen. Um, so here's an example of what would happen in one of these earthquakes. You know, this is Oregon and Washington coast. This is kind of color coded by how much the fault might slip in one scenario. Uh, so it might slip, uh, uh, 10 meters or so up uh, 20 meters uh, in the shallow part of the plate boundary. You can imagine that plate boundary surfacing here and extending underneath the North American plate. And the zone that breaks is going to be wider up here by us. It might reach all the, almost all the way to the Puget Sound or it might end by the coast. Um, it's probably the, all the slips offshore down by Oregon. But that's what would actually break on the fault and then it makes shaking distributed like this. So the shaking is going to be, you know, of course, strongest on the coast, the deepest color, red still in the Puget Sound, and it's going to be moderate, but still enough to cause damage even out in Hanford in central Washington. So that's kind of the zone that would be affected by the shaking from the magnitude 9 on the coast. Okay. So we have this project, as we call it M9. It's still got about a year to go. Uh, and the point here is to try to make realistic scenarios for what might happen during a magnitude nine earthquake. So Art again, he's kind of the driver for this. He m would make big numerical model and make, he made 30 different ways the fault might break. And we saw that in each case how much different areas would shake. Um, they tricked me into running this uh, project. Um, and then I escaped to Southern California and Allison took over. So she's now the lead. We got a couple of postdocs to do most of the work. Uh, and we had, the, we had engineers, we had people in public policy. Um, so we, we took the shaking that Art created and applied those to the buildings and the bridges and looked at the tsunamis they would make and how much downtown would liquefy and the landslides that it would cause. Turned that into kind of damage estimates we also had some work on early warning, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And then we talked about what did that mean for public policy? How could we turn this into better policies and what the public would want to know and how to train people in workshops? So we've been working on this for a couple of years. Um, so again, we're trying to see how to make planning changes so the cities are built the right way. We're trying to see if the building codes need modification how to make the early warnings effective, what we need to tell the emergency managers so when they react, they're taking into account the latest science and things they can learn quickly from monitoring. And there's also some basic science here, what happens in these biggest earthquakes. And the way to model these earthquakes you know, is, I don't know how many people here are scientists, but you know, basically scientists can make models that do anything. So we could make models that would kind of tear the earth apart or, but, what we actually want to do is make a model that reproduces what we've seen in other earthquakes. Now it turns out in magnitude nine earthquakes, there's only two that we've seen clearly. 
One is that earthquake in Japan. They had tremendous instrumentation, although it seems like a very weird earthquake. But still, it's the one that we've seen the most clearly. And there was another one, magnitude 8.8 .8 in Chile, that had a lot of modern instrumentation as well. So those are our two reality checks on our model. We have a couple more magnitude 8.3 earthquakes, one in Japan and one in Chile, that also are fairly well recorded that we can see if our model works for somewhat smaller earthquakes as well as the biggest earthquakes. And if we look carefully at Japan, it, it's sort of interesting. Again, it's sort of a weird earthquake, but it's half of what we have in our best data set. Um, and the point is, you know, this is the plate boundary. There's this oceanic plate sinking down, so there's this inclined boundary that's at the surface here and dips underneath the edge of Japan. And, in, and we, it's recorded, of course, on all thousands of instruments in Japan. And we look in, in detail, what we see is there's this giant slip out by the uh, trench, so out where the fault is shallow. It's up to 100 meters of slip. It's kind of the new record we've recorded. Uh, and that's what made the giant tsunami. But if we're looking at the damage from shaking, it turns out it's almost all caused by a couple of sharp pops in the earthquake deep on the subduction zone. So these yellow boxes indicate where you could put a magnitude 8 earthquake. So these three magnitude 8 to 8.3 earthquakes generate most of the shaking in the range of frequencies the engineers care about. They, this stuff out here was just too slow to affect the buildings. If it takes 100 seconds for the ground to go up and down, the building doesn't even know it. But if it goes up and down in five seconds or one second, then the building gets a lot of stress and has problems. So you can see that in the seismograms. These are just seismograms along the coast. And this is probably more technical than most of you want to see, but you, you can see these pops. Like there's one, the first pop that was labeled one produces this burst of energy. The second pop makes this burst of energy. Third pop makes this burst of energy. This is about a three minute uh, seismogram. So most of these big pops come from those few spots on the fault plane. So when we're trying to make a model for Cascadia, we then take the area that's going to break, put a kind of a background slip that we modulate with smoothly, and superimpose here five patches that are each magnitude eight earthquakes, where we put more kind of random patches of slip. Um, and we have to specify both how much slip happens and when it happens as the cracks moving along here, breaking the fault as it shifts. So we have to set a couple of parameters here, but it's basically five pops uh, buried on the fault. Um, once we figure out what we want the slip on the fault to look like, we have to bury it in kind of a 3D mesh to see how the shaking spreads out from there and distributes through the region. And you know, this is just a cartoon showing kind of the cross section. If you were, uh, I probably can't even express, but basically the Subducting slab is cold because it's dragging material down into the earth that's been cooled. You can see that in the cooler colors at depth. And then there's also this wedge of material where the two plates have been scraping material off, piling up kind of mud in the wedge offshore. But especially there's these deep sedimentary basins in the Puget Sound. And all this soft material is what's like jello. It kind of amplifies the shaking compared to the harder material at the surface elsewhere. So we make this mesh. Each one of these runs takes a day on a supercomputer. Uh, we used a supercomputer out at Hanford, and we also used one of the supercomputers in Texas um, and made these 30 runs. Um, and this, if it works, will just show how the earthquake uh, goes. And the real point just here is to remind you that an earthquake essentially is this fault surface that starts to break at a point and the crack kind of spreads across the region as the ground is sliding when, it, when it's breaking and that the waves radiate out from there. And this is sped up by a factor of 10. The real earthquake takes three to five minutes. Yeah, so here's the earthquake starting and it initially breaks both ways, up and down the fault. So you can sort of see where it's cracking underneath by where the strongest motions are. And you can see the waves radiating outward. And so the crack's coming up past Salem, up into Washington. And as they come to the Puget Sound, they're amplifying because the ground is so soft. Um, so that's really what we're seeing. Very strong shaking on the coast and shaking that in some ways is almost as strong as the Puget Sound because this is a 10 kilometer deep pile of soft material filling uh, the basin. 
Um, and this, and the first thing we see in these runs is, again, it's a little hard to explain, but it turns out there's sort of a Doppler effect. You know, if an ambulance is kind of coming toward you, you hear a higher pitch noise, and it passes you, and you hear it drop. So as a moving source of sound waves or seismic waves sends more energy out ahead of it than it does behind it. So this is the seismogram on Queen Anne if the earthquake's breaking towards Seattle up the coast to the north, we get kind of relatively short period of shaking, but a high amplitude. On the other hand, if the earthquake starts at the closest point to us and breaks away, we get this kind of seismogram that lasts much longer, but it has a weaker amplitude. Okay, so right off we can see, depending on how this earthquake happens, we might either get a gentle long ride or a very short violent ride, and by short I mean 50 seconds. Okay, so there's a lot of variability from run to run. So there's not, it's not as though in a nine this is what's going to happen. It really depends whether it starts in Canada or California or right next to us. Um, and it really depends if we're close to an asperity or not close to an asperity. You know, here's where the asperities were placed in one simulation. And this is where this um, point five. So this is where the high frequency energy was strong. This is where the long period energy was strong. There's some effect of this directivity, but there's also an effect that if you're near an asperity, you just had some bad luck. You're, you're going to be shaken badly. So those are really the two factors. How close are you to one of the big places on the fault, and how is it coming toward you or away from you? So to give you the tedious details, when we do this, we do it just like the engineers do for hazard maps. We make what's called a logic tree. So we, we've got our 30 simulations, basically, because we say maybe the fault that breaks it has a certain width, or maybe it's thinner than that, or maybe it's wider than that. For each of these cases, we say, well, maybe it started in the north, or the south, or the middle. And then we generate a number of random seeds to make those random looking patterns. Um, and then we also shuffle where those asperities are, because we don't know where they are. You know, people, scientists speculate, but you know, engineers don't settle for that kind of thing. They, they want us to be able to demonstrate that we know what we're talking about. We really don't know where those asperities are located. You know, the people in Oregon say they're near them. The people up here say they're close to us. Uh, it's just not known. So we do the 30 runs varying all these parameters. Um, and again, the thing that, most of this came out actually a little bit reassuring. Outside the basins around Seattle, we found sort of what we expected or even a little less shaking, although a lot of variability. But within the Sim basins, and this is just a kind of hard to interpret picture of the Seattle Basin. Again, Bremerton's down here. This is kind of the fault trace I showed you in the Seattle Fault. That's the south edge of the basin. It's kind of more gradual on the other edges. And it does go down to about 10 kilometers. So it's a, it's a very large geological structure. So this is what's filled with soft material and it amplifies the motion a lot. And this is kind of an example of what the motion looks like in the Seattle Basin and outside the Seattle Basin. So um, this is, you can see not only is it stronger, but it lasts longer. This is about a minute. And this is uh, just a small earthquake. Seattle Basin, the energy lasts a long time. So it's a big difference being inside and outside the basins. And this is the outline of the basin. It's very hard to see, but you know, here's uh, Lake Washington, the Puget Sound. You know, down here is Olympia and Tacoma. And you can see what's plotted here is the depth. Uh, let's see, I shouldn't, probably shouldn't even put this in here. But the, the, way we map, the way we map these is you know, we map how far down you have to go to where the shear velocity reaches a certain value. How, and so the faster the waves go, the stiffer the material is. So we're saying how deep do you have to go to see this shear velocity of two and a half kilometers a second. And the point is, under the Seattle, under the city of Seattle, it's about six or seven kilometers that you have to go before you get to firm material. Under Tacoma, you know, three or four kilometers, so it's again a major basin. Uh, there's a lesser basin under Everett. And you have to go pretty far until you're kind of completely outside the basin. Um, and this is how much the motion is amplified inside the basin compared to outside the basin. And I know I shouldn't put these up for a non-technical audience, but 
we're going from one to 10 seconds period, and the point is at about three seconds period, where the effect is biggest, that's about the resonant frequency of a 10 to 20, 30 story building, you're getting amplification by about a factor of five. Factor of five, stronger motion, and it lasts longer. Okay? Um, if you go up shorter period than a second, it, the effect isn't very big. And that means if you're like less than a five-story building, this probably isn't that relevant a, a number for you. Because that's if you're less than a second period, then that's what smaller buildings are mainly sensitive to. But the big buildings have this uh, issue for being in the Seattle Basin. And just to show you sort of the impact, it, it's really hard to get through all the curves the engineers use, but the point here is that um, there is a standard of what the buildings have to um, withstand. And that, for example, two seconds period, there's a certain level of shaking. This is about a third of a G with some measure, third of the force of gravity. Some of our simulations, one of the typical weak simulations, the green curve, typical simulation that made a lot of shaking in Queen Anne is the blue curve. So here at two seconds period, you know, you're pretty well under the engineering standard. <coughs> and in this earthquake, you're twice the engineering standard. So that's one of the things they're working on now, is just how likely is this to happen and how confident are we that, that this is the, the real case. And I'm sure it'll take a while to work that out. But the point is there's definitely some issues with longer period motion in the Seattle Basin amplifying more than people had thought. And we're finding similar things for the San Francisco area and the Los Angeles area as well and in Japan. It's just something where the old methods weren't that accurate. That's sort of where we are with magnitude 9 earthquakes. Um, so the general message is that long periods of the big structures and maybe some issues, shorter period, we're not really saying that anything people had already thought isn't, uh, there's no reason to doubt that people were thinking the wrong thing. So the next topic here is earthquake early warning. This is something we're building up on the west coast. And the idea is you know, the seismic network, um, if there's an earthquake, we have some programs on our computer that after about 20 seconds start thinking about what they're seeing. They've detected something's going on and they just churn about think and think and think. And about two minutes later it spits out some numbers. The numbers come to our pagers so we can jump in and see what's happening. They go to the emergency managers for kind of quick unreliable numbers that something has happened somewhere. And then within about five minutes, we tried to get on the computer and check the numbers. So we get on our smartphones or our laptops, uh, assuming somebody can wake up quickly enough. And uh, then we start putting out more reliable numbers, you know, what magnitude earthquake happened where. Um, about 10 minutes, uh, we try to be ready to respond to the public. Um, and, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, you know, we could be having press conferences or whatever. Um, and, you know, it doesn't always work like that. You know, the most recent earthquake we had, the first thing that happened, because our system didn't work, is some reporter called uh, the previous director and said, what was that earthquake? And he hung up on him, and then he called again. And, he hung, and <laughs> finally somebody checked it out, and we, we got the right report out. But what we're trying to do is make this earthquake really warning, which within kind of two to ten seconds of the earthquake, figures out what happened where well enough that we can tell the public uh, with luck before the shaking's gotten there so they can do something useful like get out of the way or grab their kids or um, so that's what we're trying to do that would make it uh, you know again short circuiting the old process by one or two orders of magnitude so clearly that has to be made more bulletproof and a lot faster and the principle here is pretty straightforward you know, we have a fault that moves we have instruments we have a city and at the time of the earthquake, these P and S waves are generated. So P waves go a couple kilometers a second. S waves go about a kilometer a second. They radiate outward from the earthquake. Um, we detect a bunch of the P waves at the closest instruments. We can estimate the magnitude of the earthquake and where it was located and when it happened. And then we can start to broadcast the information um, out to the cities while the S wave is still en route um, and warn them and eventually the S waves get to the city and people have had either a few seconds or even a minute or two for that big earthquake on the coast uh, to prepare. So that's earthquake early warning. Um, 
And these different earthquakes have, you know, different amounts of possible warning. You know, the worst case is these crustal faults like the Seattle Fault, and that's a bit of a problem because that's probably the most dangerous fault for Seattle. But if it breaks under your feet, you know, no matter what you tell people, the waves are getting there just as the seismometers are seeing them, so we're not predicting much of anything. But if it's some distance from the city, you know, we can get up to five seconds of warning. Um, not a whole lot of warning. Although you can do a lot in five seconds in terms of automatic switches and slowing traffic and, and things and helping computer systems. I'll come back to those uses. If we have these earthquakes like Nisqually, this is a bit better case because, you know, the P waves get to the surface and half the time the S waves take. That essentially gives you about 10 seconds of warning at least of what's coming. Um, so there is some amount of time, not very long, but enough to do a number of things. And then the best case are these earthquakes along the coast. If you're really, I shouldn't say optimistic, but if when an earthquake starts, you, you speculate that it might break the whole coastline, you can give people up to three minutes of warning because that's how long it would take to get from Calif the rupture to get from California to the Puget Sound. Um, but it'll be probabilistic at that point. There's an earthquake underway would be the warning. It might reach you and shake you in a couple of minutes. And as the rupture progresses, you know, your warning time is getting shorter as it approaches, but you're getting more certain that there's a specific risk coming your way. So that's sort of the scenario of what this will do as long as it works the way we designed it um, with the early warning system. Um, so we like to, you know, we've spent a fair bit of time arguing with our legislators trying to make sure this gets funded, and I think that they're generally buying it. It's moving forward. So what we tell them is, you know, you can slow traffic, you can slow down the trains, and, you know, the trains not only could derail, but oftentimes they're headed toward where there are going to be landslides on the track. You really like to stop the trains when, when there's a big earthquake. Airports can kind of abort landings and takeoffs. Hospitals uh, are very eager to have the warning to get their generators going, to get communications out before they, there's kind of the chaos of uh, a big earthquake. Um, they like to, they, 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 I don't really like that analogy of the scalpel in people's eye that they, you pull back. So, um, <laughs> but again, that's what they say on TV. But, uh, the, the people with, with the Intel is very interested because they have all sorts of terrible chemicals and they'd like to kind of back off their equipment before it all, and the equipment's also expensive. So there are a lot of examples now in Japan where they, they've gotten warning and the equipment's been kind of fastened and then doesn't get damaged and they can restart the operations much faster. The computer companies are similar. When they're doing financial transactions, they don't want to, and who knows what these automatic programs do if a disaster starts to, to kind of unscramble like the stock market after a, they'd really just like to batten down everything and start it up again once the chaos is over. And they, one of them told us that they can hit a button and switch their operations to China. You know, so there are a lot of things you can do with a little warning to kind of make sure operations are seamless and um, can restart or resume very quickly. Uh, but of course, a big thing is to tell people, you know, that what's coming so they can find their kids or their pets or turn off the stove or get away from the windows. And ideally, what we'd like to do is give people a, a warning that shaking's coming with advice about what to do. Because we really don't want people staring at their smartphones and the graphics kind of mesmerized and, uh, instead of doing something. So, so one of the points is Japan has quite a sophisticated system and has for 10 years. It's got some issues. The one we're building is better, um, but clearly it's not impossible. China's building a very fancy system, and of course they have tremendous uh, risk of earthquakes from their old cities and faults under their entire country. Mexico's had a working system also for a decade. It's a very special case, a simple system, but it's effective for Mexico City. In fact, it worked in that earthquake a couple of months ago. Korea, Romania, what we like to tell the Congress people is Mongolia's built an early warning system, and, you know, are, is the U.S. up to it? <laughs> so so that, that, that they find that fairly convincing. And, you know, the physics are pretty simple. You know, the ground shakes, you try to figure out what happened and get the warning out, and the speed of light with the warnings is a lot faster than the seismic waves. So it's not rocket science. Uh, so, so that's... So we're sort of in the middle of building this thing. Um, 
you know, we can, lots of lists of what you can do, get away from the windows, the chimneys, things like the water heater that might fall over and ignite, turn off lights and stay away from power lines. Um, and also, once the shaking starts, you can't really move. A strong earthquake uh, is something you're not going to be running, you're not even going to be walking. You're pretty much stuck where you are when the shaking's strong. So if you have a few seconds to get in the right place, that's helpful. You could even send some texts if you have a couple of minutes. We tell people not to use the phones, but to text, because there's only limited bandwidth, and if everyone picks up the phone, that's a problem. Uh, turn off the stove, slow down, and pull off the road. And if you have time, it's good to get out of a bad building. But if you don't have time, you know, the worst place to be with strong shaking is just outside an old building when all the pieces are falling off. Um, so if you have enough warning, get outside, but don't get outside if the shaking's strong. Just duck cover and hold. Okay, so our case, or our poster child for this is trains, the BART trains in the Bay Area. Um, there's uh, about 50 or 60 of these trains that are running. Uh, at rush hour, they're, half of them or more are going 70 miles an hour. Uh, there's a risk of derailment. So there are three reasons they like to say why we need to protect BART. Partly these trains are expensive. They cost $30 million a piece, so each one that wrecks is pretty poor uh, for BART. Uh, also, at rush hour, each one has 1,000 passengers, and you know, the actuarially lives are $5 million a piece, um, so that's a problem. And the third issue is that if there's really bad earthquake in the Bay Area, the surface uh, transportation might be thoroughly disrupted and they've spent billions of dollars reinforcing BART with the idea that it might be the best way to get around the city, but not if derailed BART cars are filling the tunnels. So for all these reasons, that they're spending a lot of money fixing BART, and the early warning system is just a drop in the bucket of what they're spending for this. So that's one example of the use of early warning. Um, and also, it's not really intuitive, but you know, in, the, in these earthquakes, the, a lot of the damage is, is minor, but so many people have it, it's the bulk of the, the problem. And for Loma Prieta, uh, you know, this magnitude six and a half earthquake in the Bay Area back in 1989, they did a study where they showed that you know, it cost billions of dollars and half of the expense were people who just tripped and fell and hurt themselves. So if you just give people some warning with instructions and they're not doing the wrong thing like running or don't really know what's happening around them and get hurt, you've saved a lot of money. And, you know, Northridge, they did another study, and again, they found there were these non-structural hazards, which means the building didn't fall down, but just somebody fell or something fell on them, and they were injured. So just giving people a heads up is, uh, is uh, would save a lot of expense and probably a lot of lives in a big earthquake. So where are we? we? We've handed out the software to a number of people in the Pacific Northwest. Um, they're really just testing it for the most part. Big companies like Microsoft, Intel, and Boeing. Uh, the government people like Portland and Seattle. Um, Port, Sound Transit. The state governments have these test software and the federal government's participating as well. And then I've got two of them on my smartphone. Um, <coughs> And it's actually worked a time or two. Um, but the issue here is that, uh, you know, in Japan they've had this for quite a while, but right now there's no way with our cell phones that you can send out a signal to 10 million people. You can send it out to those of us here at the uh, University of Washington. Okay, if you send it out to 1,000 people, that works pretty quick. But if you send it out to 10 million people, it takes minutes for it to get through. Amber alerts, for example, take minutes to get through. There's not a way to get it out there on the one or two second time scale to, to make the early warnings effective. That's what we're, and I, just last month I was at a ceremony where the, the mayor of Los Angeles promised that the citizens of Los Angeles would have it next year, and we have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's, we have, these politicians get a little carried away. I probably shouldn't say that if you're taping it, but it's, uh, it's kind of jaw dropping. Um, so we're sending, so right now we have the software with testers. We're, we also have a couple of companies that are prototyping things like fixing the, uh, 
the uh, water treatment centers and the water supplies so that they're more hardened uh, it, when shaking's uh, been detected. But there's also some people near Portland who are trying to make sure the reservoirs above the city uh, react well to warnings of shaking. In Los Angeles, they're testing some school rooms. They're talking about having the fire station doors go up in the Bay Area uh, at the detection of shaking so that they don't get jammed shut just when uh, the fire um, engines are needed the most. So we have a number of test cases that we're using. We're developing more. Uh, and we're also trying to make sure the software works right every time and doesn't make false alarms. That's one of the issues is to tell from the first waves there's a big earthquake, but not send out signals when somebody kicked two of the instruments at the same time. And Japan sent out a false alarm for magnitude 9 already. And they, their whole administration had to get on TV and apologize to the country. So it, it's a risk. So this is what it would look like in the Northwest, basically hundreds of seismometers, a couple hundred GPS stations, a bunch of uh, data um, treatment centers, uh, and run from the University of Oregon and the University of Washington, and linked to the California system. So we've prom oh, and, and the plan's 16 million a year, so that's what the, the budget target, we're at the level of uh, 8 or 10 million a year now. Um, and so we're on course to build it over the next few years. Um, and I think that that's going to happen. Um, and in fact, there's something in the congressional legislation promising a limited public rollout for next year. And so the way this works is whatever we've gotten to next year is what will be defined as a limited public rollout. <laughs> because, you know, that's, that's just the way this stuff works. Uh, okay, so that's, that's sort of the early warning system. Another topic I want to touch on is offshore instrumentation. As you saw in the, the Cascadia subduction zone is largely offshore. And in Japan, they have a number of issues with their, that led to that earthquake in 2011. One, they didn't realize that patch of fault was stuck, so they didn't prepare. Another issue is looking at that set of faults, they, they, they were a little overambitious and they said, we expect a whole set of magnitude eights out here. So they built up tremendous protection against magnitude eights. So a 10 meter tsunami and they were ready. Uh, but then they had a magnitude nine and had a 30 or 40 meter tsunami and it went right over the top of everything they built. And worse, everyone thought they were safe from the 10 meter tsunami. So, you know, the 40 meter tsunami kind of overran a lot of places where people had retreated to, thinking they'd gone far enough. They had a couple of problems with the early warning system that they, again, earthquake happened. They said, well, we're expecting an eight, and now it's an eight, and they quit trying to figure out what had happened. They just warned people about an eight. But actually, the earthquake grew to a nine, and the warning never grew above an eight, because they hadn't built the system that way. Uh, so now they're making a fancier system. Another issue is that they, they figured out where the earthquake started, because for an 8, that's really what mostly mattered. So that said, an 8 here doesn't shake Tokyo very much. So they didn't really warn Tokyo, but the 9 happened and it broke halfway to Tokyo. So it's actually breaking twice as close to Tokyo as the system was saying it had, as well as the underestimate. So they would have liked to have warned Tokyo. Tokyo wasn't badly hit, but the warning should have warned Tokyo and it didn't. So what they're doing now is they're putting instruments on the seafloor. This is 150 spots with this cable connecting them. Comes into land six different places with redundancy. Um, and it costs half a billion dollars. So next time there's an earthquake, they'll have a very good idea what's happening early on, or at least until all these cables are broken by submarine landslides. Um, so in the Northwest, we're, we've proposed a seafloor instrumentation. Um, a somewhat different configuration. Uh, but again, if it's costing hundreds of millions of dollars, we still have a lot of work to do to convince uh, the government that this is cost effective. Um, there aren't as many people on our coast. Um, so, and the earthquake happened less often here than they do in Japan. So we're still studying ways to get those instruments down there and have the data back immediately for warning purposes. So that's uh, just a concept so far. But it would be very valuable with these instruments to actually see what's happening on the seafloor and not to be surprised by a patch of fault that we didn't even know was loading. Have a much better idea what's happening if we have instruments right on top of it. <clears throat> and here's an example of uh, 
a time where instruments on the seafloor have been quite useful. This is, you can't tell from this map, but this is uh, Costa Rica. And they put instruments all around, including on the seafloor. And what they could see was uh, the fault was locked around here, and they could see it slipping shallower. So this is a, the trenches over here. This fault is dipping down under here. They could see this whole thing around was slipping, but this patch wasn't. And they knew when the last earthquake was, and they said, you know, next decade we have to watch out for this earthquake. And sure enough, in 2012, they had this magnitude 7.5 earthquake right where they were watching. So they were they actually had very little damage from knowing what to expect. It worked almost perfectly, um, you know, if you're happy with a 10-year time scale for a prediction. Uh, the only problem is, you know, they said this might break, but this broke. So this patch didn't break. So now they're saying, well, sh are we safe? Or is we're about to have a seven and a half over here? And they don't really know if this is just now going to slip slowly until the next earthquake, or if any day now they're going to have a magnitude seven earthquake here. But still, that, that's a much better idea of what might be coming than uh, we have on Cascadia. And you know, finally, with the Tohoku earthquake, this gets pretty technical, but again, this is one of these subduction zones where you're seeing a map with the trench up here, the plate interface here, and you know the big locked patch here that moved 100 meters, made the giant tsunami. And in retrospect, what they can see is there was one of these slow slip episodes. So like I said, every 14 months under the Puget Sound, we see the slow slip. Um, and, but they saw a slow slip worth about a magnitude 7 earthquake in two days that was followed you know, two days later by this magnitude 9 earthquake. So if they'd been watching the seafloor, they would have seen that there was action on the faults underneath uh, the, you know, their coastline. And, in, and actually they were quite lucky because the slow slip followed a magnitude 7 earthquake that two days beforehand. And that magnitude 7 earthquake actually made them practice with a lot of their equipment. A lot of their tsunami equipment hadn't worked and they fixed it because they saw that during the 7, although it still was only made for a 10 meter tsunami. Uh, but there was this extra magnitude 7, a slow slip, that if they'd seen it, they would have been especially on their guard um, for a bigger earthquake, uh, knowing there's a higher danger of a bigger earthquake soon. So again, it, it could be valuable to have instruments on the seafloor, keeping a careful watch on where these faults are active, both with the earthquakes that we, we can see, but with the slow slips that are much harder to see on the fault plane. So that's pretty technical, but one of the reasons we'd like to get a closer eye on the fault offshore. So I think it's my second to last slide, and this just shows the kind of timeline of earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest, so 1990 up to the present. And the point is, when I came to the University of Washington in 2006, they promised me a magnitude 5 every year. Okay. <laughs> So here's like a line about magnitude 4.8, and you can see there's, what, seven of these and six of the 13. Almost every year there was something bigger than a 4.8, including earthquakes under Portland, uh, the Squally earthquake, and Paul Bowden, the, the guy who actually runs the network, the network manager, and I, he came from Memphis, I came from UCLA. Since then, the biggest earthquake we've had is a 4.7. So... Anyway, that's... <laughs> so just the last slide here. This is the, these are the points I tried to make, which is that, you know, we have all kinds of science we're doing at the University of Washington, the volcanoes and the subduction zone and all the faults and earthquakes. Uh, there are these three major kinds of earthquakes we're worried about, the ones within the slab, the plate boundary, and the ones in the shallow crust right under the cities. We're building this early warning system that's uh, already working on my phone and it'll be um, everyone else's phone if not too long. We look carefully at the big earthquakes on the coast and we see these basins amplify more than we thought at long period, which is an issue the engineers are going to have to factor into the big buildings. Um, there's this issue that it's been quiet for more than a decade. We, it makes it even harder to get people to take care of the unreinforced masonry around here. Um, so we need to get some better laws about the bad buildings. And we'd like to get instruments on the seafloor to get a good look at what's happening on that plate boundary so we can better anticipate what's likely to come. Okay, so that's, that's what I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
article you were talking about, I think that was in the New Yorker in 2015 that talked about. Yeah, that could well be. Okay, I live about 300 yards from I-5 near SeaTac. Um, I'm thinking that that's not really literal, that <coughs> it's just not really going to totally liquefy it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the liquefaction is pretty patchy, so I couldn't, a lot of the ground by SeaTac is going to liquefy. Um, and I couldn't exactly tell you which places would and wouldn't. Um, but, you know, the liquefaction isn't really a problem so much for individual houses. It kind of, it's more a problem for kind of the patches of downtown and the airstrips and, uh, actually, I shouldn't say that. There was an earthquake in New Zealand, Christchurch, where half the downtown was basically turned uninhabitable by the earthquakes. You know, people weren't killed by the liquefaction, but it cost a lot economically, and people just had entire neighborhoods they couldn't reoccupy. So I have to say, I don't know the details of where it would liquefy near there. It's really an engineer, geotechnical engineer, who could tell you. Okay. So it would be probably kind of patchy here and there. Yeah, it'd be patchy, and it'd be the low-lying, flat areas where the ground is wet and soft. Yeah. You talked about uh, the fast moving P waves and the slower S waves. Uh, are the P waves, uh, um, can you feel them? Yeah, you can. And actually, they, often in an earthquake, you feel kind of a rattling, and then the kind of slower. So that's kind of the rattling is the P wave. It's very much like a sound wave. Uh, and then the S wave is kind of a sideways motion and noticeably longer period. Yeah. Um, from watching uh, news headlines over the last two or three years, it, I have the impression that there have been major earthquakes all around the Pacific Rim, except here in Washington. So oh. is, is that true? Or? No, there have been a lot of earthquakes. And we argue about whether the last 10 or 15 years since 2004 have had more earthquakes than normal. And certainly it's had more than normal, but it's within the range of random fluctuations a little bit more. We don't really understand how they could trigger each other. But the Pacific Rim, uh, there are a lot of patches that haven't broken, not just the, our local patch. And there's no reason to think that our patch is next. Uh, and likelihood is really this 12 to 18 percent in 50 years. There's no reason to think it's unusually high at the moment. Maybe it's twice as high if there really is this burst of earthquakes in the last 15 years. But I wouldn't pick on our area as being particularly vulnerable at the moment. Yeah. Oh, and, I, and there was an article that really annoyed us at the Four Corners of the Pacific a couple of years ago that made the cover of Time magazine as well um, that had nothing behind it because uh, really uh, there's nothing special about the San Andreas and the Cascadia Fault around the Pacific that means we're due for anything in particular. Yeah. So you've noted the need to change laws about Seattle's bad buildings. Are there other policies that you think at this point would be critical for our legislators to consider? Well, as we, we would like the schools to have drills for earthquakes. It's a little hard to convince them to have a, one drill a year to have uh, prepare people what to do in an earthquake. Um, there's a whole range of things they're doing in California that's sort of a model for us. You know, the highways would love to have the... Uh, resources to make sure the highways can stand up to an earthquake. My understanding is right now with the Seattle I-5 corridor, they're trying to make at least one way out of the city work because, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to get two ways without a... I think they have a plan where the highways will be fixed in 100 years. So well, these things, are, they come down to funds and then you have to judge what's the risk and make sure you have your priorities right. And, you know, I'm kind of an advocate for earthquake preparedness, but you know, the big picture has all kinds of needs for the public funding. And it would be nice if they could do more for earthquakes, but I'm not the one to prioritize uh, that. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much, Dr. John. Okay, sure.